and that God is going to speak to you and he's going to speak to me equally the same. Before we do anything else, let's close our eyes and pray. Kind and loving Father, I want to thank you once again for giving us this opportunity that we can come together this afternoon and listen to your words. Empty mind and head as I am, Lord, I ask that you put your words in my mouth and in my mind, that whatever I say should come straight from you, Lord, not what I think, but what you want your people to hear. Be with us, Lord, and bless us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, this afternoon, we'll be sharing a few words from the Bible. We will try to be as quick as possible so that we can enjoy the lunch and then we'll go on with our lives. I want to thank the choir for the item that you did, you did sing. Uh, it's a question that should ponder in everyone's mind and heart that were you there when they crucified my Lord? I wasn't there when they crucified him, but one thing I know for certain is that my sins, we are all there. My sins were nailed to the cross when they nailed him to that cross. With that in mind, thank you so much. That was a sermon on its own. And then our special item from the sister there, it says, uh, to be forgiven and to be born again. And then it says, be the forgiven by Jesus. Not, not, not everyone else, but by Jesus. And then there was peace of mind that comes with that. There is joy that comes with that. You see, forgiveness is not just a, a matter of forgiving someone or being forgiven, but it does bring that peace of mind. If I'm holding a garage against someone that I don't want to forgive that person, trust me, it's like taking a dose of poison each and every single moment, thinking that the other person is the one who is going to die with it. But actually, I am the one who will die out of it. You see, forgiveness can rebalate you individually. Once you forgive someone, you find that the burden is lifted from your life. Sometimes you do feel that people can hold garages. And if you are holding a garage against me, trust me, I will know just when I'm coming towards you, you're, the way you will react to me, the way you will behave, or the way you will pretend, it's all obvious out there for people to see that, oh, okay, there is something wrong here. Okay, sometimes you can easily tell that this person seems to have an issue. It might not be with me, it might be with someone else, but the way they will behave, the way they will react, you know that there is something wrong. But at the same time, it equally shows the same that if you had a garage with someone and that person has forgiven you or you have forgiven that person, they are coming from that direction, you are coming from this direction, you can easily sense that there is no barriers. There is nothing hidden under something, some, some form of carpet or anything else. Everything is nice and smooth. It brings peace of mind and joy. You can pretend that I have forgiven you, but then you go and then when you try to sleep, you are still thinking about that person. Trust me and I can guarantee you, you haven't forgiven that person. If you tell me that I have forgiven you, but each and every time something is going south, you come to me and tell me that, do you remember that two weeks ago I did forgive you for this? It just shows that you didn't forgive me for what I did that time around, but instead you put it in a bank somewhere that, okay, I will be banking all the sins or all everything bad you did against me, I'll put it in that cabin. And every time you do something else, I will take it and I will add it there. Every time you do something wrong, I will go and recollect everything from there. The good thing with God, when God forgives you, then he wipes the slate clean. You are fully forgiven. He doesn't count 
it against you. Okay. When you have asked for forgiveness from God and God forgives you, he's not going to tell you next week that, do you remember last week you came to me and then you did ask for forgiveness for this? God, our God is a loving and kind God. He doesn't count on our sins as long as we ask for his forgiveness. Our topic this afternoon is entitled, The Battle is Not Yours. So we have already started. We are in the midst of our topic this morning because I'm saying the battle is not yours. You see, folks, sometimes you might have that problem or that issue whereby you are failing to forgive someone. The reason you are failing is because you yourself, you haven't been converted fully to an extent whereby you are just as good as Christ. If you are fully converted and you are struggling to forgive someone, you better take a serious look at yourself and ask God to forgive you first and God to help you to learn how to let go of the past. If you are holding on to what happened in the past, there is no way you are going to focus on the blessings which God wants to give you into the future. Because each and every time you take a step forward, then you take four or five steps backwards. You are not going to go anywhere. You will be going into the same circle again and again. From our scripture reading, we are told that the children of Israel were moving from Egypt going to the promised land. According to God's plan, it was a journey which was supposed to take only 40 days and then they are in the promised land. Why did it take them so long for them to move from Egypt to the promised land? You see, some of the blessings that God wants to give you, they depend on the conditions that you yourself must enable those conditions for the blessings to fall upon you. If they had only obeyed what God wanted them to obey and follow God's instructions exactly, they could have made it within 40 days. The moment they left Egypt, they are now on their way going. They are approaching the Red Sea in one side. There are mountains on the other side. And the Egyptians are coming behind them. For the children of Israel, the easiest option was, you see, the armies are coming. Either they will get us back into captivity. And that captivity is going to be far much worse than what we have been going through. One thing that they forget is that when the children of Israel went into Egypt, they never went there as slaves. It wasn't God's intention that the children of Israel would be slaves in Egypt. They went there to survive during the famine. After the famine, they were supposed to go back home and carry on with their lives. But because they get so used to the lifestyle in Egypt, when the famine was over, nobody, not even a single one of them, ever thought of going back home and carry on with life as normal. So here is now God trying to take them back to where they belong. Take them back to their promised land. It's not them themselves going, it's God taking them. But the problems comes in because they themselves now want to be the master plan of everything that is happening around. They want to strategize how they will move from Egypt to Canaan, where they will have the stopovers, where they will get the water, where they will get the food until they go on and on until they get to the promised land. But it was God who was actually moving them from Egypt, where he couldn't bless them more than what he has already done, to the promised land where he will bless them based on the promises that God made in the past. For them, they didn't see that way. All they thought was, we had enough food to eat. We had a place to sleep. Yes, they were cruel on us, but still, life was better in Egypt than in the wilderness. So, 
if you can put our verse up there. We do find that in verse 19, in verse 9, the Egyptians are following the children of Israel. As they are following them, Pharaoh had to gather their char his chariots, his mighty army, and they are following them. The message then did get the children of Israel before the Egyptians did catch up with them. If you can put the next verse, please. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. The Egyptians were not where the children of Israel they were, no. But they could see them from far that they are following us. And just because they are following us, the children of Israel themselves, they were so afraid. They already made up their mind that, okay, if we are being followed by the Egyptians, this is what it means. It means that we are back in captivity. Things will be worse. It will never be the same. And then they cried out to the Lord. And they even murmured and complained to Moses, saying, Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you wanted us to come and die out here? If you put the next one, please. For them, they didn't see any salvation of the Lord apart from this is us finished. There is no hope. Our situation is hopeless. Then as that was happening, God was the one who was in charge and God was the one who was in control. Then God did tell Moses something that the children of Israel were not aware of. God was telling Moses that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. In other words, he will make sure that Pharaoh will still follow his heart saying, I need to get them back at any cost. You see, folks, there are two things here that the children of Israel have left Egypt. If Pharaoh didn't follow them and just let it go, there was no any other consequences which could have followed Pharaoh just because he's trying to follow them. But for him, he couldn't let them go. When he thought about them working for him, it was more important for him to get them back and carry on life as usual. So on the first part, we have got Pharaoh here who doesn't want to let things go. But it's not only Pharaoh. The children of Israel, on the other hand, they still have that same mentality as well. When they think how life was in Egypt, they were saying life was better in that captivity. Life was better in bondage. You see, sometimes it happens to us Christians that God is trying to move us from captivity and trying to take us to a promised land. When God promised that he wants us to be free, he didn't say that you will be free when you get to heaven. Am I right? Does God want you to be a slave in this world and then you enjoy in heaven? Okay. When God is promising that he is going to bless you, did he say that he will bless you in heaven? He will bless you right here on earth before you even get to heaven. So sometimes God wants to move us from where we are to where he will be able to bless us. But because of our mindset, we always think that where we are is far much better than where God wants to take us to. Sometimes we think that our situation is so hopeless that God can do nothing about it. The only way is for us to go back to what was good in the past. It might be that we have got a different kind of Pharaoh who is following us to take us back into captivity. It might be that maybe we do have a financial Pharaoh whereby our finances cannot tie up. But God wants to bless us that we should be financially free from all those financial bondages. 
But for us, we feel that no, I think if I go back and try, maybe if I just go back and get that loan here and that loan there and then patch them up, then life will be better. Sometimes where you are, you are at the age where God wants to bless you and then you move on with your life from there. It might not be financial bondage. It might be relationship problems that we feel that the relationship that we are in now, it doesn't have any hope at all to an extent whereby we think that what used to happen within the relationship three, four, five, seven years ago was far much better that we want the situation to revert and go back to that situation when God wants you to move to a different level altogether. It's time that we need to accept that if God wants to take me from here to there, then I have to let go of the past and follow what God wants me to do. Sometimes it might not be that that's the case, no. It might just be a wake problem that we are facing. You see, sometimes God wants to find a perfect, better job for you that he already installed for you somewhere that you have to be working there. But within our mind, we think that where we are, it's the best ever that we can ever be. So sometimes God in his wisdom will decide to bring Pharaoh in the form of our employers to bring problems to the situation within the workplace that he is trying to drive us out of that workplace to move on with life, to go to where God is trying to bring us and bless us. But with our small mind mentality, we think that no, 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 no. This is the perfect job. I simply have to own up and then go and apologize. Though I haven't done anything wrong, but I simply have to take it. My brother, my sister, it might be God is bringing these issues deliberately to make you walk away from that job and he will give you a job which you will always praise and glorify God for that job. But if you stay there, then how is God going to bless you in Egypt with the blessings that he has installed for you for the Canaan? It's only if you are in Canaan that you will get the blessings that belongs to that land. You are not going to get the blessings promised for that land when you are here. If you are here, you still stand here. But if you go where God wants you, you get the blessings that God wants to give you. So the title is, the battle is not yours. Why am I saying the battle is not yours? You see, folks, the battle here wasn't about the children of Israel and Pharaoh. No, it was between Pharaoh, who was the Egyptian God, and God from heaven, who was the children of Israel's God. The battle is between the two of them. The God from heaven is making the Pharaoh's heart harder for God to show Pharaoh who is God. But the children of Israel are getting involved to an extent whereby they are having sleepless nights. They are having issues maybe with BP and all that because they are so scared. Yet God is saying, don't worry. All these issues have already taken care of them. The fact that he's following you is just following my plan that I already put in place that when you left Egypt, the Egyptians will follow you because I haven't finished dealing with them yet. They still have to follow you so that I can deal with them and then you go on. It is at that point that God is saying, don't worry, these Egyptians that you see today, you're not going to see them ever again. It might be that God is talking to you and me at this point in time that the problems that we are having in life today, the issues that we are facing in life today, God has already taken care of them. And those issues, those problems, they will all be gone for good. But you need to do one thing, that is to make the conditions right for those blessings to fall upon you. You cannot be holding garages. You cannot be angry with your colleagues, your neighbors and all that, and expect that God's blessings will fall upon you. You need to 
sort out your relationship between you and your God before God will do that for you. If we can go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, you'll find that we live in this physical world whereby the issues that we are facing, we think that they are all physically to be dealt with. But that verse says that, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness and in the heavenly places. So if I am just a human and this battle is spiritual, how is it going to be my own battle? There is no way I'm going to fight a spiritual battle when I'm human. But God is a spirit and it's his own battle to deal with. You see, sometimes we think that maybe the issues that we are facing is because we have done something wrong and God is not happy with us, that God is punishing us. Trust me, not all the time that's the case. Sometimes it's the devil bringing that mind into us to think that we have break away from God to an extent whereby God is now punishing us. A story is told about Brother Job from Job chapter 1, verse 8, whereby Job was carrying his own daily routine, daily business, doing everything as normal without any problems whatsoever. As Job was going on with his day, then God and the devil had a meeting somewhere else, whereby Job didn't have a say on whatever the agreement was going to come out of that. Then God was hosting about Job, saying, uh, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So God get to an extent of bragging about Job, dialect to the devil, saying, Have you ever seen this man? There is no one like him. We need to be trying our best and ask God to help us to be just like Job. He was a man just like you and me, but they said he was an upright man. We need to be upright as Christians, just like Christ. One who fears God, we need to fear God, just not verbally, but through our actions, through our behavior, even through our meditation, we need to fear God. We need to shine away from evil. Job was doing all those kind of things. But that didn't guarantee that just because Job was an upright man, then he's spared from any of the things that happens around the world today. He lost his kids. Then he lost all his property. Then it went on to his own personal physical body that he was sick but he never did anything wrong. Then to make matters worse, the last person that Job could expect to come and tell him that, I think you have done something wrong to God, just to swear at God and then God will get rid of you. It was the missus. So Mrs. Job said, you know what? If even me, I now believe that you have done something against God and God is punishing you. So all the friends, they're coming and saying, you have done something wrong. The missus is saying, you have done something wrong against God. But Job still stands that, no, 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 no. I know my Redeemer. Even though he slays me, I'll still hold on to him. So that happened to Job. But there is another story whereby you find that as we are living, sometimes we do receive bad news in a form of a different kind of Pharaoh coming to us. It might be that you receive a letter maybe from work whereby they say that, okay, your employment services will be terminated over the next 28 days. So thank you for your services. Okay. There was once a story from the Bible, which is coming from the second book of Chronicles. If we go to second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse two going down but we're not going to go through all those verses a story was told whereby they come and tell Jehoshaphat who was the king 
of Israel that time around. That the Assyrians, they are coming to attack him. And him, he was wise enough to know that on his own and his army, there is no way they are going to fight the Assyrians and then they'll end up victorious. If anything, they only had few options. Either call them aside, sit down with them, come up with an agreement that, okay, you don't have to attack us. Instead, we'll be contributing towards our freedom. So we'll be paying you to buy our freedom. But you see, this king was one of the kings who was so faithful towards God. And when he was working with God over the past years, then he realized that there is only one, one place that he can get his salvation from, and that's the Lord from heaven. So this king decided that he want to take the matter to where it belongs to. And when this was happening, you find that if you go to the next verse, They said, uh, Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. When he stood there and then he took the matter to God and presented it to God. And he was asking God, when you go home, take time, read it. He was asking God saying, you are God from heaven, right? And you are still the one who is on the throne. You are still God who is in control of all mankind on, on the world. You are still God who is in control of all kings and rulers of the world. So we have got this issue now here that we can't handle. But we are only trusting in you, God, that you will be the one who will handle this problem for us. Then they prayed to God and they fasted to God. Then in verse 17, they got an answer which came from God about their situation. So in verse 17, it says that you will not need to fight this in the battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Okay, so point number one. Yes, the battle is on. Yes, the problems are there. Yes, you will face the issues in life. It might be finances. It might be your relationship. It might be kids at school. It might be kids bringing problems at home. It might be your employers bringing issues. It might even be that the government is bringing issues to you. But here, there is a word of the Lord saying, you will not fight this battle. Why is, is it that they're saying you will not fight this battle? The battle is not yours. You can take all your experience, you can take all your strength, all your energy, all your finances, and try to fight a spiritual battle physically. You are not going to succeed. It's not your battle. And then it went on to say that position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. You don't have to go into hiding, no, but position yourself and see the salvation of the Lord. The salvation of the Lord is there promised and is there guaranteed. All you have to do is be in anticipating that God's salvation is coming towards your direction. Then it went on to say, who is with you? Now, if you go back again, who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem? Do not fear or be dismayed. Why are they saying, who is with you? It's because problems might be there. Yes, we are fighting a spiritual battle, yes. But the one who is with us is much more stronger than he who is with them outside there. Then it went on to say that uh, tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So you might have financial problems. Don't just sit still and do nothing. Face the reality. Accept that you do have financial problems. You might have maybe family issues. Face them that you do have family issues. You might have maybe employment issues. Face them that, Lord, I've got this issue. But you are not facing them in the way that you are fighting to justify yourself. You are not facing it in a way that you are trying to say that, okay, I'm trying to prove to the world that this isn't me doing this. No, no, no. 
you are facing the reality. And then they said, uh, the Lord is with you. If you go to the next verse, they said, then Jehoshaphat bowed down and then his face to the ground and Judah and Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed down to the Lord and worshiped God. So the army is there coming to attack them. But God has said uh, they don't have to worry. The moment they learn from God that they don't have to worry, they stopped worrying. They left everything to the Lord. Whatever he wants to do with it, let it go. Let it, the Lord deal with it. Then they started worshiping and glorifying God, praising God. You don't have to wait until God blesses you and then you start praising God for that particular blessing. You can start praising God now, knowing that God is still going to bless you based on the promises that he promised that he will do it for you. So they started worshiping. They started praising God. And then if you go to the next verse, if you go to the, yeah, if you stop on that one, they said uh, on the following morning, now they are going to see the salvation of the Lord. Okay, so they are going into a battlefield, but they have been told that God is the one dealing with it. They have already been told that you don't have to fight. You don't have to throw an arrow towards the enemy. That has been taken care of. So they are going there just to witness what God was going to do. So they made up their formation. Instead of them saying, we need our army to be in the front there. The soldiers with their armor and everything else, they go ahead and then start fighting because they have been told no need to fight. They did bring in musicians, the choir, to sing praise and glorify God while they are going to witness the salvation of the Lord. You might going, be going through financial difficulties, maybe physical challenges, maybe illness, maybe relationship problems. It might be issue with kids and all that. But God has told us three things from this passage that the battle is not yours. It's his own battle. He will take care of it. Not only that, you don't need to fight. You might have an issue that is burning in your heart. My sister, my brother, you don't need to fight. Let it go. Leave it to God to fight on your behalf. And trust me, you will get the guaranteed victory and the salvation of the Lord. The other thing that we have been taught from this passage is that the Lord is going to be with you. And if the Lord is with us, who can be against us? So even if everyone else is against you, as long as the Lord is with you, you are guaranteed that salvation. The children of Israel were there. They tried to cling on to what the lifestyle was in Egypt. They couldn't let go. But God still had to do what he wanted to do for them. The Egyptians perish. Had it been that Pharaoh decided to let go and don't follow them, not even a single of those 600 chariots was going to perish. But because he couldn't let go, then he ended up facing the punishment which was heading his direction from God. Sometimes as Christians, we might be the ones who are tending to become Pharaoh towards other fellow Christians or towards other friends, towards other workmates. It's time that we have to let go and let God fight the battles. There is no need for us to carry on and on and becoming a Pharaoh on our own until God punishes us. Because if we still carry on, then God will do what he is supposed to do. And that is, if someone who put his trust in God and take the battle to God and the battle is against you, God is supposed to honor his promises. So he will honor the promises by dealing with you in order 
to bless the other person. Let us not be on that side, but let us be on the side whereby God is fighting our battles and God is blessing us to give us all those blessings. We need to praise God regardless of our present circumstances. For we know for sure that salvation is promised to us. Whatever the circumstances that we are going through, let us learn to trust and leave it to God that God will deal with it. Sometimes we might think that God is not dealing with it, but it's just that it's not his perfect time to give us what is best for us. Sometimes we might think that he is four days late, but he is still on time. It might just be that the condition for that blessing need us to wait a little bit longer so that when the blessings come, we'll be able to look after that blessing. Otherwise, it will come today and we might end up losing that blessing because we were not ready to accept that blessing. May the Lord be with each and every one of us. May God help us to know that he is always there for us and he will bless us. And he, we take all the battles to him. The battle is not ours. It's his battle to fight. It's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Sometimes you might think that just because it's someone that you are facing at work, you are able to see them, then it becomes a physical battle. It's not a physical battle. There is someone standing behind that person who is causing all those things to happen that we might not be able to see. Let's leave it to God and God will deal with it. May God bless each and every one of us and help us as we get the blessings that have been promised to each and every one of us. Amen. Let us pray. Kind and loving Father, we want to come to your presence once again, Lord. This time around, we want to ask, Lord, that you address each and every one's situation within this building, Father. We might be having different issues in our lives, Lord. We want to hand them all to your throne of grace, Father. It's not our battle. We leave it to you, Father. Whatever the circumstances might be, we do give them all to you, Father. In a very special way, Father, we want to thank you for giving us victory that the issues that we have been having in the past are no longer going to be there anymore as long as we trust and have faith in your God. For our victory doesn't come through the mighty of our own doing, but it's through the faith that we do have in you. We ask, Lord, that you be with each and every one of us as we'll be leaving this place. May you protect each and every one of us as we'll be traveling to different places, Father. We ask that you bless each and every one of us abundantly based on the blessings that you have bestowed for us. We pray for those who are sick and they didn't make it to come today. We ask, Lord, that you touch them with your healing hand. For we know that it is through the promises that you give us that if we pray for those who are sick, they will be healed. And that's part of the victory that we know that we are guaranteed, Father. Be with one and every one of us as we will be departing from here. May our presence here, Lord, bring glory and honor to your throne of grace. And may you forgive us if we have ever done anything wrong today, which was not supposed to happen. Glory and honor be to your name, Father, forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.